All right, so resuming with uh, Rudolf Steiner, um, we have to pick up the thread of the lectures chronologically uh, in volume two now. We were in volume five, um, and I don't know what goofy person uh, arranged these lectures in, in a way that isn't chronological because it's really necessary to read them chronologically because very often he'll begin a lecture by saying, now last time we made the point and the reader will be like, well, last time what? What's he talking about? So that's why it's important. And the other reason is because he's actually telling a larger story. As we'll see here, there are threads, that uh, karmic threads that he is weaving here through all of this. Um, one of those threads, and it's a, an important one, is the penetration of Islam on the astral plane into the West, bringing materialism along with it. Um, and that story will resume in, in this particular uh, lecture here. Um, so let's start with Karl Marx. So he tells the past life of, of Marx and Engels, uh, which will come as absolutely no surprise whatsoever. Um, Marx never had a dime in his life. He was always poor, and Engels always picked up the tab for him. Engels paid his rent. Engels uh, gave him money. Um, Engels was his basic patron. Marx was the primary theoretician. Engels also wrote some books, but um, he, we wouldn't even know who Engels was, I don't think, without Marx, the master theoretician of the dialectic of history, uh, borrowing from he Hegel. Um, so here he is, uh, looking very regal in, in his chair. And now, so Steiner looks back at their past life. They had a past life together. Um, I forget what century it was. It was sometime, it might have been the 8th or the 9th century, uh, right around the year 800. Um, a lot of these guys, it's funny, a lot of these guys um, go all the way back to 8, 750 to 950 or 1,000 and then reincarnate 1,000 years later. Not all of them. Um, uh, some lifetimes, will, as we'll see in future chapters, do recur one on top of the next. It just depends on the individual and the individual's karma. So this was in northeastern France where uh, Marx was a man who owned a huge estate. He had um, lots of property and lots of money, and he would go on campaigns of plunder. He had a, a little band of brigands that he would take with him, and they would go on these campaigns of plunder, uh, robbery, uh, they would bring back booty, um, and, um, just keep amassing his estate. So, but on one of these ill-fated expeditions, um, or an expedition that was ill-fated, he, he, he went out, he lost all of his men and he came back alone to find that his property, now remember that the economy at this time is based on feudalism. Uh, so his property had been taken from him by Engels, actually. Uh, we don't know the names of these guys, but um, by Engels, who had come and seized his property and taken it away from him, um, including all, everyone, his serfs. and So basically, he's there by himself, and then uh, he's reduced to the status of a serf on his own property. So he stays there. Now he's a serf. And then he starts talking to other men and they start gathering around campfires at night in the woods, talking about how they can overthrow the concept of overlordship, the very idea of it, get rid of it, get rid of the idea of private property. And that's that lifetime. They're, they're holding these conversations. Uh, Marx trying to figure out a way to do away with um, overlordship, the whole concept of it. So the solution doesn't come to him until he reincarnates centuries later as Marx and writes Das Kapital, in which the whole idea of private property is eliminated. The, the whole uh, communism comes in as the ideal um, and capitalism is to be dismantled. That ends up being uh, his solution. And then, of course, Engels owes him, so by the law of karmic balance, he becomes his patron. It's a very similar situation to Franz Schubert and uh, the guy 
who was the Prince of Castile, who later became Baron von Spahn, who also supported him uh, because Schubert, remember, took him in. Schubert was a Muslim uh, who took the Prince of Castile in and gave him shelter when he was chased out of his estate. It's a very similar uh, situation. Um, so very often when um, you get a good patron, and I haven't yet managed to find one of these, <laughs> then there's karmic ties uh, where the guy owes you one. So by the law of karmic balancing, it, it, it has to be paid. The bill has to be paid. Okay, so let's get back to this story about the penetration of Islam into the West on the astral plane. So he, now recall, so here's Harun al-Rashid again. And recall, uh, about the same time, right around the year 800, uh, Baghdad has been built recently and it's constructed as a confluence between Western Islam, which is Arabic, and Eastern Islam, which is Persian, Shiite. And uh, he's attracting both, which is why to, to this day in Iraq is such a mess with the Shiites uh, claiming this area and the Sunnis claiming that area. Um, it was deliberately built uh, to be a confluence of the traditions of both. And the Arabs specialized in theory, in philosophy, in uh, astrology, astronomy, uh, algebra, alchemy, whereas the Persians specialized in poetry, poetry and literature. Uh, Ferdowsi uh, writes the Shah Nama, the great epic, right around the year uh, 1000. And uh, we have Nizami and eventually Rumi. Um, all these great poets, uh, the Sufis coming out of Persia in the Shiite tradition, which is mystical Islam, uh, and the Sunni tradition, which is uh, metaphysical, but metaphysical in the academic sense of, of with the influence of Aristotle. Um, we wouldn't even have Aristotle uh, in the West without the uh, invasion of the Arabs across North Africa and up into Spain. Uh, we wouldn't even have Aristotle or universities either for that matter, because the first universities were built in Paris and London based on the curriculum of Aristotle. So uh, the penetration of Islam, it, it, its influence on the physical plane is profound, but Steiner's story here is it's, it also penetrated on the astral plane. And so Harun al-Rashid, remember now, reincarnates as Francis Bacon, who introduces the scientific method of empiricism. He basically invents the whole concept of inductive reasoning, beginning with particular case studies, uh, recording results in experiments so that they can be repeatable. Uh, it's all empirical, empirical, empirical. It's all based on sense data. Uh, it's, not, it's not really metaphysical at all. Um, so we have that. So the penetration of Islam via Francis Bacon with the invention of the scientific method. And then Harun al-Rashid's right-hand man, recall, um, the John D of his court, whose name we do not know, um, re reincarnates uh, contemporary with Bacon as uh, Amos Comenius or John Amos Comenius. Here he is looking as though suddenly he, he was just suddenly interrupted in the middle of writing a treatise, uh, who was a bishop, a religious man, and a moralist. For him, education, recall, uh, was a moral thing that uh, children should be allowed to have it, women should be allowed to have it, um, textbooks should be written in the vernacular, this pan-sophist idea, uh, which was to him a very moral idea. So then, all right, so what happens is Steiner says when these two guys die then, uh, and so recall that they have been Arabs uh, in, at the court of Baghdad, Harun al-Rashid in his world, which was far, far more sophisticated than the contemporary uh, Char Charlemagne's court with its uh, ragtag band of Irish monks who had been chased out by the Vikings uh, and went over across into uh, Charlemagne's world, people like Alcuin. Um, so um, this is what happens. And once they get to the other side, these two guys, as it happens, Steiner, Steiner says, on the other side, there are also masters and pupils. And so each one of these guys developed a school 
on the astral plane around them of individuals gathering around them. Uh, you, you have Baconians, let's say astral Baconians, and you have astral uh, Comenians. Um, both are, are inventing, have invented modernity, universal education, and the empirical method. But the difference is um, Bacon could have cared less about morality. That wasn't something that interested him. Morality, uh, the, the uh, modernizing of education for Comenius was, was a moral thing. And so what happened was, in the 19th century then, two historians now incarnate, who are not these guys, but they're their pupils, one of which is uh, a pupil of Francis Bacon, and this turns out to be Leopold von Ranke. Um, where is he here? Uh, let's see. This is his Wikipedia page. There he is. Leopold von Ranke, who is more or less the inventor of uh, modern, uh, as it says here, Ranke was probably the most important historian to shape the historical profession as it emerged in Europe and the United States in the late 19th century. His dates are 1795 to 1886. So he was one of the pupils on the astral plane of Bacon, and he's bringing the empirical method now into history for the first time. Um, and he remained a political historian, but the important thing for him, once again, was method. You go to the archives and you base all your documents on archives, on letters, on letters back and forth between diplomats. Everything has to be uh, ca capable of concrete citation. Um, and so, he, let's see, he writes texts like, uh, let's see what the titles of some of these are. I've never read this guy, nor would I have any interest. Uh, it, it also He's also inventing specialization in, in history. Uh, the Ottoman and the Spanish empires in the 16th and 17th centuries. Memoirs of the House of Brandenburg and History of Prussia during the 17th and 18th centuries. Civil Wars and Monarchy in France in the 16th and 17th centuries. So you can see that he's inventing specialization. Uh, in other words, this is from my point of view, not Steiner's, but from my point of view, this is the beginnings of the end of the university as what Quigley called an instrument of expansion. It's now beginning to petrify into specialization, starting with von Ranke. So then uh, one of the pupils of Comenius then incarnates in the 19th century as the historian uh, Friedrich Christoph Schlosser. Uh, let's look at his Wikipedia page. Here he is, 1776 to 1861, uh, professor of history at the University of Heidelberg. Um, and he was mainly the bomb before von Ranke came along. But um, now, again, uh, some of his works, uh, let's see, we've got the history of the iconoclastic emperors of the East, in which he's fighting with Edward Gibbon. Um, but it's the, his masterpiece, according to Steiner, is the 1815 publication of his uh, Weltgeschichte, the world history, which was written over in many volumes, kind of like Toynbee writing a study of history. And then uh, also a history of antiquity um, and uh, a history of the 18th century and the 19th century till the overthrow of the French Empire. So he is also um, inventing specialization. But the difference is now, uh, as it says down here, history was to him, as it had been to Cicero, a school for morals. So now we see the Comenian influence, the morality, the moralism of Comenius is coming through. And Steiner says on every page of his texts, if you read his uh, world history, you find moralizing, moralizing. He's sitting there in judgment, judging the individuals. He does not give objective portraits of these uh, events that he covers, uh, the iconoclastic emperors and so forth. Um, he's very judgmental about them. Uh, very moralizing. And so that's the influence of Comenius on him. And so it's interesting that uh, in this chapter that he talks about two individuals who are not reincarnations of Bacon and Comenius, but pupils from the other side who have come in already with a karma, with karmic intention and purpose. Uh, but nonetheless, note that they still represent 
the penetration and influence of Islam into the West on the astral plane. So this is why it's important to read these chapters in karmic relationships chronologically because they tell a story. And one of those stories is the penetration of Islam into the West on the astral plane, bringing with it materialism. Um, I don't know why Steiner associates Islam with materialism specifically. It does have a materialistic emphasis. There, there's no doubt about that. Uh, the Arabs are very, very concrete in contrast to the Persians. Um, they are very, very concrete. Um, but uh, so that's the story that he tells um, and it'll continue to develop. Um, so we'll leave it there for that chapter.